Thank you for tuning in. This is a first for me. I've never done this kind of thing, so hopefully this will go smoothly. Uh, if not, please bear with me. Uh, I do want to mention the fact that I have a new book out, and it is available at the town hall. Uh, it's uh, called More Bits of Clifton Park History. It's a sequel to my earlier volume, and uh, uh, that makes a wonderful Christmas present. So get lots of them for, for Christmas. The proceeds go towards the uh, restoration and uh, management of the Historic Rooms Tavern. Okay, so the topic is Through the Stereoscope, the Time Machine to the 19th Century. Uh, so in the 19th century, there, of course, were no radios, there were no phonographs, no televisions. Um, no movies, motion pictures, but every American home, most every American home had a stereoscope. They were very inexpensive. People could afford them. And the stereo views themselves were inexpensive. Uh, you could buy them for pennies. Uh, and what they did was they provided a window on what was going on in the rest of the world at the time, uh, much the way our television does today. So, um, was it was probably what we would consider the television of the 19th century. The stereo photograph photographs were produced by a special stereo camera that had twin lenses and they were spaced about two and a half inches apart, which is the distance that sep separate the eyes. And then the stereoscope allowed each eye to see only the half of the view meant for it. And so you're seeing it in, in three dimensions. From the 1850s, uh, when uh, stereo, stereo views became popular, through the 1930s, these stereographs preserved the face of America. And those viewing these three dimensional images found that it was just like being there put you right into the scene. Now, I have a lot of stereo views in this presentation. It was really designed to be on a larger screen, so I hope you're going to be able to see them okay. There is a way to free view these views in stereo. It doesn't work for everybody, but you can try it if you want. When you see a stereo view, if you look at a distant object, focus your eyes on a distant object and keep your eyes focused on that distant object and then look at the stereo view, you'll see the two parallel views, but in the middle, you will see the view in 3D. And eventually you'll be able to close off those, uh, those, those two other images and you'll just see it in 3D. Now, if I give this, this program ever in person, I have glasses to give to people so that they can actually see them in 3D. But for now, you know, if you can't manage to do that, I've never been able to, to do that, so, but you can try it. Uh, so photography was invented in 1839. And uh, shortly after this, stereo views were created. Now, the, the, the first, stereo views were daguerreotypes, which was the early form of photography. This was put on a, a, a silvered plate. And uh, that's very hard to look at because, you know, if you've seen a daguerreotype, you have to hold it just so, uh, because otherwise, you know, the light reflects off it. It's so shiny. Um, and, the, and the viewer for this, so that you could see it in stereo, was actually a part of the view. So you'd have this pair of stereo views uh, daguerreotype views and, and the, it would unfold and the viewer would be a part of it. So you'd get a viewer with each of the stereo views. Uh, there were also glass slides. Now those were, that was the early days of photography. By 1851, uh, the first major introduction of stereoscopy occurred at the 1851 International Exhibition of London, England. This is when it became popular uh, and, and they started mass producing these views. Now the reason, one of the reasons 
uh, it became popular was, of course, now they could print on paper. You didn't have to do it in a daguerreotype or a glass slide, and they could print them on paper. So they were less expensive to create. And the other thing that happened, this is a view, by the way, this is an 1851 view of that International Exhibition of London, England. And this was the Crystal Palace, uh, those of you who know about the uh, these fairs these international fairs that were held. This was the very famous uh, Crystal Palace exhibition. And then the following year in 1852, they had the Crystal Palace in New York City. Um, but anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. But th this is what sort of made it popular because people who attended the fair could pick up these stereo views as souvenirs. Those who couldn't travel to London to see it could buy these stereo views and see what it was like. So what made stereo views so popular at the time was the fact that a, a, uh, uh, a viewer was devised by Sir David Brewster in 1851. And this is what the uh, early viewers looked like. This is a, uh, a Brewster style stereoscope dating to about 1855. Uh, and it's... Uh, uh, it's a beautiful thing. It's made of paper mache, and it has mother of pearl inlay. You can see the, the two lenses here that you view it through. Uh, the card would slip through here. This is, a, it would slip through here. And this little trap door opens up to allow light to come through so that you, you can see the, you can see the view. And you can't see it in this picture, but um, the back side of it is open. It had a glass lens to allow light through so that you could look at glass stereo slides with this as well as the cardboard ones. So this was the early Brewster stereoscope that uh, was invented in 1851, the same time that the, the uh, viewing the stereo views became popular because of the uh, Crystal Palace exhibition uh, international exhibition in London. And just to show you, <laughs> here's the comics uh, stereo view showing uh, a Brewster stereoscope. This guy is looking at views. You can see he's got the trap door open <laughs> and he's not paying attention to this uh, guy who's making moves on his wife in the background. <clears throat> so this was the early, early viewer. Then uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes uh, devised a stereoscope to look at these stereo views um, in 1860. And, and uh, he, he so this is called the, the and, and a Boston photographer by, uh, by the name of Joseph Bates developed the slide. Okay, so what Oliver Wendell Holmes developed was this whole, this hooded viewer with this, uh, with, that you, and then you put the stereo view here. And then, but Joseph Bates developed the sliding card holder. So this is called the Holmes Bait style of stereoscope. And this was the popular stereoscope throughout the second half of the 19th century and into the 20th century up until 18, 1930, these stereoscopes were popular. And this is actually has the Joseph uh, Bates um, stamp right on it, and it says Boston underneath. So this is one of the original uh, Holmes Bates uh, uh, stereoptic and viewers. And as I say, they were popular throughout the second half of the uh, 19th century and into 1930. This is a later stereoscope, uh, about 1900, and it's uh, made of, it has an aluminum hood, which uh, has some engraved designs on, but it's still basically the same stereoscope as was uh, developed by Oliver Wendell Holmes and Joseph Bates. And you can see this handle here, uh, it folds so that, you know, you can store it uh, and it won't take up as much room. This handle will fold into it. Now, these things were very inexpensive, so everybody could afford one. Here's an advertisement from a 1904 Sears Roebuck catalog. You can see you could buy, buy a nice stereoscope for 24 cents, and the views themselves would cost pennies. You could get like a dozen views for maybe a dollar. Uh, 
not even a dollar, maybe 50 cents. So uh, everybody could have, most middle class families could affo afford uh, a stereoscope and the views. Now, here's a, here's a uh, stereo view showing uh, one of these Holmes Bates viewers being used. <laughs> and it's interesting because it's sort of the same kind of view that we saw uh, with the stereo view of the, of the Brewster viewer. You've got the guy looking at views <laughs> And this guy's making moves on his wife. So <laughs> it's the same kind of comic thing. And there, and this was another thing that they did that a lot of these comic views as well. So it tells you a little bit about uh, uh, life in the 19th century. I always look at the furniture to see what kind of furniture it is and the type of wallpaper. And you can tell a lot about uh, 19th century life by looking at these stereo views. But now if you were, if you had some money you could buy some elaborate uh, viewers for your stereo cards. These are table models. This is called a stereographoscope. And uh, these would be maybe on a center table in the middle of your, your living room and you'd have stereo cards around it and family could gather around in the evening and they would look at stereo views. So uh, what, what it is is, um, as you can see, it folds down. This props it up at an angle. It would be convenient for viewing. And you have the pair of lenses to view the cards in stereo. But you also have a magnifying glass, which is stored underneath here, okay? So if you want to look at a photograph, magnify a photograph, this pair of lenses folds down. You pull the magnifying glass out. Here it is. So you can see the, the stereo lenses are, are folded down. And then you put a photograph or a carte de visite or anything you want magnified here on the stand and you look through this lens. So you can do both. And this was sold at a E and HT Anthony and Company, New York City. That was a major store in New York City in the 1860s and 1870s. They stole, they, uh, uh, they, they sold, of course, these stereographoscopes. They sold stereo views. And there's some wonderful stereo views showing uh, the interior of the store with racks of stereo cards and tables with stereo viewers on. Um, many of these were sort of imported from England. A lot of these were made in England. And then the, the retailer put their, their name on it. <clears throat> Here is another one of these stereographoscopes. Here are the, the uh, lens, magnifying lens to uh, look at photographs is just a part of it. Okay, let's go back a minute. And it has different kind of eyepieces here, but the same thing, it folds down so that you can uh, fold it down and then this moves back and that folds down and this folds down on top of it. So for storage, it would not take up as much room. Now here's another kind of stereographoscope uh, that's designed to fold down into a box-like formation when not in use. Uh, you can see it's sort of the same sort of thing. You've got the magnifying lens for photographs and the, the stereo, pair of stereo lenses. You put your stereo card on here. If you want to look at a photograph, this thing can be raised up higher so you can look at it through the magnifying lens. And here is a comic stereo view uh, showing a stereographoscope. You can see it, it's here on the mantle. I've sort of enlarged it here so you can see it. And here's another, uh, I mean, they did all, all sorts of things with these uh, uh, stereo, stereo uh, stereoscopes. This is a uh, cigar box stereoscope. You can see it folds down into this little box, which is the shape of a cigar box. And this is the way it looks when it's open and you would place the stereo card in these grooves. And you know, to, to focus it, that's where you have a series of, of, of uh, grooves because you don't have the sliding rack like you have on the Holmes Bates viewer. So in order to get it into focus, you might have to move it back further or forward. <clears throat> and then there was uh, this kind of a viewer. Uh, they call this a sweetheart viewer. 
because two people can look at stereo views at the same time. You see, we have lenses on this side and on this side. And it holds 50 stereo views back to back and they're on a rotating belt. So you can turn these knobs and since they're back to back, you know, two people can look at uh, the different stereo views while they're, while they're looking. And what you would do would be you'd open the top. The top opens up so you can let the light in. And this is, this is sort of silver. It's like a silver paint or something. So it would help reflect the light into the stereo cards. And uh, again, you can turn this and look at your 50 views and then change places and the other person can see the other views. And this was a patent by Alexander Beckers uh, to have these cards on this rotating belt. So you could have more than one card. And this is the, this is the, um, the patent marker, but this was made by James Lee of New York City, who was making these things in the 1860s. Uh, in New York. And what's interesting is that, you know, um, a lot of these viewers, these sweetheart viewers, uh, were made in mahogany and, or, or walnut, these exotic woods. This is a less expensive model. It was made of pine and it was grained to look like rosewood. This is painted decoration. So it's grained to look like rosewood. And, and here's these uh, Becker, uh, Alexander Becker patented viewers uh, shown in these uh, stereo cards. This one is not a sweetheart viewer. It's just you look, just one one viewer looks at it at a time. And here's here's one on the table uh, in the back of this stereo view here. So there were also the variety of viewers that people could use. This is one of this is a late. Uh, viewer based on the Holmes Bates style, but it's like a telescope uh, it's, or binoculars, like binoculars, and it enhances the stereo view. And later on, the cards, the stereo cards were originally flat, and you can sometimes date them uh, by the color of the borders. Uh, you know, orange borders were popular in the 1870s. Uh, the uh, Tan borders were early 1860s, et cetera. Yellow, yellow borders are early cards as well. And then later on in the 1880s, they started to curve them. See, this is a curved card, which would enhance the stereo viewing. So if you have a, a curved card, it, it's a late card. It dates to the probably the 1890s, 1890s, early 1900s, okay. Let's talk a little bit about the photographers. There were a lot of stereo photographers, uh, again, because these were so popular, they were so cheap. And again, it, it opened the world to people. They could see sites that they couldn't actually travel to. So here's photographer Charles Bierstadt with his party at Yosemite Valley, California. And this is in 1875 when he went there with his uh, group to, uh, to photograph the wonders of Yosemite in stereo. But this is an interesting card because it actually shows the photographer's party. More than 10,000 photographers produced an estimated five to seven million different stereo views in the United States alone. I mean, this is, one, this is a wonderful source of documentation as to what our country, what the world looked like at that time, you have to remember prior to 19, 1839, uh, there was no photography. You know, people wanted a likeness of themselves. It had to be painted. You had a, a painter who would paint it. So uh, people were really taken up with this new medium of photography, particularly stereo photography, because you could look at it and it put you right into the photograph. So here he is, here's a, his, equi his equipment packed on on horseback and they're uh, in the Yosemite Valley to, uh, to photograph. Um, this is a, a view of Sankety Head Lighthouse on Nantucket, taken in 1870. On the back of the card is the name of the photographer. You can see photograph, this is the back of the card, photograph and published by uh, Charles Shute and Sons, Edgartown, Massachusetts. What's interesting about this is you can see the photographer's wagon right here in the photograph. 
I've sort of enlarged it down here in the corner, but this has got his name on it and this is how he carried his equipment. He traveled around uh, in this wagon taking photographs. Um, tourists to Nantucket could buy these and take them home with them or people who never got to Nantucket could, could find them in a store and, uh, and see, what was, see what it was like on Nantucket. But I, I thought this was kind of neat, the fact that it actually shows the photographer here with his wagon and his uh, son or somebody else must have taken the picture. And then here's the people who operate the lighthouse standing out in front of it. Here's a, uh, a view of Congress Spring here and one of the grand hotels in Saratoga. Um, I can't remember the name of the street today. I'm sure you guys will know it. Uh, I just remember the library used to be on this corner and you turn down here. But anyway, this is Congress uh, Spring and one of the hotels. But I wanted you to see the photographer's wagon parked here. So the photographer's taking this picture and there's his wagon right across the street from where he's uh, taking this stereo view. Uh, Niagara Falls, this is the Horseshoe Falls from the uh, Canadian side. And this was a very popular tourist spot and people wanted to have their photographs taken by the falls. And so here is the photographer's wagon right here. And I've, I've sort of blown it up here a little bit so you can see it. And so the photographers are right here at Niagara Falls, ready and willing to take your picture so you could uh, take it home with you. And by the way, why don't you buy some stereo cards of the falls? Uh, so this is, a, again, this is a, by Charles Beardstadt, who we saw his party at Yosemite Valley a few slides back. But here he is at Niagara Falls as well. Uh, this is also Niagara Falls. I just wanted to show this because you can see the, the photographer stand is right here. Okay, here's a, I did a close up of it here. You can see a little canopy over it and the name of the photographer and the falls in the background. And uh, again, a, a popular tourist attraction and people could have their photographs taken there as well as buying souvenir uh, photographs of the falls. And in fact, here is some tourists there uh, posed at this uh, photographer stand and they had their photograph taken in 1870, about 1875. This is a really interesting stereo card because uh, this J.P. Doremus, this photographer, uh, traveled on the Mississippi River. And this is his uh, his studio, a floating studio. You can see all of the windows here to let the light in so that he could uh, uh, develop his uh, stereo views. And this in itself is a stereo view of his photo studio. Really, I, this is really kind of neat. And so, uh, uh, you know, people could come to have a stereo view of themselves taken. But what he did was he published a series of stere stereo views um, of, of the Mississippi River, places along the Mississippi River. So he traveled from place to place and took pictures and then published them as a series of stereo views along the Mississippi. And this is these are all done about 1875. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the stereographs themselves. Okay, so what did this do for, for people? I mean, it, it, it opened the world to them. So, you know, they could get stereo views of, say, the Roman Forum or, or Jerusalem and uh, look at them in stereo and it would put them right into the picture. So uh, this was a really important new aspect of life for people. They recorded our history. Um, uh, the Civil War uh, was going on in the 1860s and photography, again, was, was still young, but people like, uh, like Brady photographed the Civil War and there were stere stereographers there to uh, create it in, in 3D for people. So the, these two stereo views were taken probably about 1865, right after the war to show some of the damage. This is Fort Sumter here and you can see how the cannonballs uh, hit the fort. 
and here's a ruined church in Charleston that, that was bombed out during the Civil War. This is interesting. This is a uh, one of those torpedo boats that was used in the Civil War. Uh, this is uh, uh, just outside Charleston. Some of you may have read about the Hunley, which they brought up in Charleston Harbor that was used to attack um, to attack Union ships. And here's one of these torpedo ships uh, right on the lawn there near Charleston. Uh, this is probably a pretty rare view. Uh, and then below it, uh, this is the jail and military courthouse here, this log structure where the Indians who were engaged in the massacre of 1862 in Minnesota, this is part of the Civil War also out in the, uh, the Midwest in Minnesota, and they were confined here in this courthouse. This is where they were, were tried. So you can see the, the Native Americans here with the blankets on. Here's another one. And then here's the guard. It sort of looks like they're fraternizing with the guard here. They're outside taking some fresh air. And this particular uh, photographer photographed this. It's a great historic record uh, of the Civil War. And of course, um, later on, uh, World War I, the Spanish-American War, these were all photographed in stereo, and you can find stereo photographs of, of all of these events. And, and one of the uh, ones that I, uh, I have that I, I didn't uh, scan for the program is the battleship Maine, which was attacked. And I've got, there's photographs of that, the, the ruins of the, the battleship Maine during the Spanish-American War. So there's all sorts of... Uh, events that were photographed by these stereographers. But the most popular things that they photographed were the resorts, because people who went to the resorts wanted to take home souvenirs. So they would buy these stereo cards as remembrances of their visit to places like Saratoga. Um, and of course, we had all these grand hotels in Saratoga in the 19th century where people would come, particularly Southerners would come north to get away from the heat and they would stay here. Famous people like uh, like the Vanderbilts and, and Madame Jumel, who was uh, Aaron Burr's wife for a short period of time. They, they all visited Saratoga and uh, became uh, well-known characters. Uh, anyway, the one above is of uh, Congress Hall, one of these large hotels about 1870. And then uh, there were amusements also. This was a circular railway that was uh, in Saratoga. And you can see they come both ways. This one's coming towards us. This one's going away from us. And you just sit on here and take a ride around this circle, you know, circular railway. <clears throat> it gives us an opportunity to see what the insides of these hotels were like. I mean, uh, and when you look at these in 3D, again, it's just like being there. And so you are traveling back in time. It's wonderful. And you can see how elaborate these, these hotels, these palaces were and why people came to spend time here at this, at this resort. Look at the chandeliers. Um, this is the Grand Union Hotel, the parlor, about 1875. And, and here's the dining um, the dining uh, room of the Grand Union Hotel. And our waiters are all here waiting for us to come and dine. And you might notice that a lot of them are um, African-American waiters because uh, when slavery was abolished, a lot of the black people went to the cities and they went to Saratoga Springs and got jobs working in the hotels. So uh, you have a lot of uh, African-American uh, waiters here waiting to seat you at their table and wait on you. Um, you could take a Sunday drive out to Saratoga Lake from Saratoga, and you could board a steamboat and go to the southern end of the lake and visit the White Sulphur Springs Hotel. Here it is in 1870. Here is the, the spring for which it was named. And here's the steamboat docked out in front of the hotel. And uh, uh, some of you older people might remember, I remember it as a kid in the 1950s. It was Luther's. It was owned by the Luther family. And then by that time, 
uh, they called it Luther's, but the building was still there in the early 50s. It's gone now. And I remember seeing this well house until maybe about 10 years ago. Uh, it was on the other side of Route 9P and uh, it, it collapsed. But here we have a view that recreates the whole, the whole thing, including this, the large steam ship that would stop there at the hotel. It's not too, it's just north of Browns Beach on 9P. Uh, other resorts, here we have uh, Oak Bluffs on Martha's Vineyard, which was a Methodist camp meeting uh, uh, area. And it, it started out um, in the 1860s and people would tent. And it, what would happen would, they would come with church groups with their own church and they would camp there, uh, set up a tent. And then they have a large tent uh, which was where they would meet for Sunday service and, and, and lectures and, and that type of thing. And uh, here's the beach where they could, you know, go swimming. <laughs> when they went swimming at this time, people were almost fully dressed. <laughs> I don't know how they swam. Uh, and here you can see in the distance, you can see the, the dock because people would have to arrive by steamboat. It's an island on Martha's, Vin it's on Martha's Vineyard Island. Uh, and here's a big hotel where people who were not part of the religious aspect of it could uh, could rent a room here at the at the hotel. Uh, so now what happened was those tents at Oak Bluffs got replaced by little cabins, little cottages. So today you have all these little Victorian cottages. It's still a Methodist camp meeting ground, and you can stroll through the the uh, campground and see all these little Victorian cottages. Uh, not so far from home, we have another Methodist camp meeting ground at Round Lake, and we have stereo views of that as well. And you can see how similar this is to the Methodist camp meeting ground on Martha's Vineyard. Uh, this too started in the 1860s, uh, originally tents, and then they started building these cabins. And it was because of its location on Round Lake and because there was a railroad station there, people could arrive uh, by train. Disasters were another very popular uh, theme for stereo cards. Uh, people could, uh, you know, today we, we get pictures in the newspaper, we get pictures in magazines, we see television, we actually see, witness the disasters on television. Well, in those days, people would read about it, but they wouldn't be able to see what it was like. Uh, so they issued these stereo cards and sets. And so this is the, um, the Great Chicago Fire of 1871 up above here. And notice again, there's the photographer's wagon right here in the foreground, but you can see the ruins from the fire in the back. This is the one that was caused by Mrs. O'Leary's cow who kicked over a lantern, if you remember your, your history. And, and below it here, um, we have searching for the dead among the ruins of, uh, in Galveston, Texas in 1900. This was the great hurricane of 1900 um, there's a great book written about this called Isaac's Storm, uh, and I recommend it. It's all about the, uh, the hurricane of 1900 that hit Galveston, Texas. And you can see it devastated the area. Um, it was, uh, and, and nobody expected it. It just came up on the, on the, on the, on the last minute. And of course, they didn't have, they didn't have the communication system, uh, at, that we have today or the other ways of determining uh, what direction hurricanes were going to go. But anyway, uh, disasters is a, is a really uh, popular uh, thing with the stere stereo photographers. Uh, the Johnstown flood, uh, here's a view of that, which was 1889, Johnstown, Pennsylvania, the dam broke and destroyed uh, the, uh, the village of the city of Johnstown. And here you can see, here you can see a body under the, actually, and I have to tell you, this is not a dead body. The photographer staged this. He had somebody go in and, <laughs> and, and pretend he was a, a body. But by the time these, these photographs were taken, the bodies had all been removed. 
but uh, just makes for, for a more dramatic uh, photograph, of course. You can see in the background some of the damage here also. And there's a whole series of these views of the Johnstown flood. I have about mm, probably about 50 of them, different views. Um, another disaster that was popularly photographed was the volcano eruption on the island of Martinique uh, in the Caribbean. Uh, you can see Mount pa Paley here in the distance. And uh, here are the ruins on Martinique. Uh, St. Pierre was the name of this community and nothing's left of it. And in fact, um, there was only one survivor of this disaster. <laughs> and it was some drunkard who was in the prison. The prison was, uh, uh, was of course, stone walls. And so he was protected uh, and he survived. Nobody else survived. There's a lot of, a lot of dead, a lot of people escaped before uh, the damage came. But this prisoner was the only one who survived. And uh, he was um, featured by uh, P.T. Barnum in his circus. He traveled with the circus as the lone survivor of this hurricane eruption. But there's a whole series of, of views of, of this disaster. And of course, then this, that was in 1902. And then we have the San Francisco earthquake of 1906. And there's a whole series of views uh, relating to that. And there were many other local disasters. There's a, a tornado disasters. There was a grandstand that fell that was recorded in some local community. So uh, uh, these disasters were very, very popular. Transportation, uh, ways of transportation that we don't have today, but were popular in the 19th century. Um, this card here is the steamboat landing in Albany, New York. They, you had the, the day line and the night line that went back and forth to New York City. And here's a steamboat docked right there. Uh, the station, the steamboat station where you'd buy your ticket is, is still there actually. It was a, I don't know if it's still a restaurant or not. It was a restaurant, uh, the day line office. Uh, La Berge, I think, was the name of it at one time, was the French restaurant. I'm not sure whether it still is or not. And here's a view of uh, down in New York City at the Salt Street Seaport. Look at how active it was. Look at all of these boats, these sailing vessels that were down there. Uh, this is about 1890, and you can see the buildings there at Salt Street, which is now a historic district in New York City and a popular tourist spot. <clears throat> Here's our own Erie Canal. Uh, you should all recognize this. This is a, a view of Rexford from the cliffs. And uh, this is lock number 21 right here, which still exists. It's in the Schenectady Yacht Club, okay? And this is the feeder canal that brought water into the Erie Canal. The Yacht Club still uses this lock. They have a crane over it and they use it to take the boats out of the water in the winter and put them back in in the spring. And this section of the canal is still there, but it just goes down a little further and then it opens into the river. So, and sometimes a lot of, a lot of the boats are docked in here as well. You can go in there with a kayak uh, and you can see how it turns. And then it goes over the aqueduct into the, the south side of the Mohawk River. And here's a, a, a train or an early train on this trestle, this high trestle, um, which is uh, the Frankenstein trestle. Uh, in Crawford Notch, New Hampshire. There are also city views and, and overall views, sort of bird's eye views that, that stereographers took of various uh, cities and communities. This is a, uh, a view of Cohoes uh, near Erie Canal Lock 18. So here is the canal here, bridge. And I believe the lock is just out of sight here, the tip of it here, but you can see the Mohawk River in the background here. So and this, this has got to be, I think, before the Harmony Mills were built. You don't see those. Here's, this is the other side of the view. You can see the Mohawk River back there. But there's a number of these views as well. Famous people. This would introduce uh, the public to these figures who were important in their life. Here we have uh, General Ulysses S. Grant, 
he visited Oak Bluffs on Martha's Vineyard in 1874, and he stayed at this cottage, which was the bishop's cottage, uh, at the at the uh, uh, camp camp meeting ground. And his wife is in the view, and some of his cabinet members who also visited. You see the place is all decked out to welcome him to Oak Bluffs. Here's William McKinley taking his oath of office, President of the United States in 1901. Here's Teddy Roosevelt and his family at Oyster Bay, uh, 1901. And then there were daredevils uh, and uh, the like. Here's a, here's a man crossing the, the Niagara Falls, the, the, the chasm there, Niagara Falls on a wire with a wheelbarrow. Uh, and you can see the people on the bridge watching the performance over there. And uh, his name was uh, Calverly, 1893. And there's a whole, whole series of daredevils doing things at Niagara Falls, walking the wire across this, uh, this chasm. Uh, here's a famous burlesque star. I can't remember her name, but there she is. And uh, this particular photographer uh, did a lot of uh, portrait photography and stereo of famous people. And here's a banjo player. Uh, and this was uh, sometimes businesses would give out cards too. Uh, of, of local scenes to, to the public as a, as a promotion. Uh, but uh, Jay Gurney and son also specialized in portraits of people. Occupations is another uh, theme for stereo views. Uh, and this is whaling. Uh, and th this particular view, it, it's interesting. Uh, Charles uh, Shute and sons, uh, who were from Edgartown, and we, we met them earlier. We saw his photo wagon on Nantucket. Uh, but he did a series of views on whaling, uh, uh, and it was called a whaling voyage. And there was like about 18 different views showing the whole process of, of catching a whale, killing it, bringing it on board, trying it out. It was a whole series of views. He did these in 1869 when whaling was still uh, being done. And what's interesting is these are not actual views. He, he, these are models. He, he put this together using models and took these pictures. So here we have the, the boats, the ship in the background and the boats attacking this whale, harpooning this whale. But as I say, it's a whole series that shows the whole process from sighting the whales to going out and killing it, bringing them back to the ship. And it's all done with models. But this is for real. This is a, a whale being cut into uh, in Nantucket Harbor. This is a, uh, a marble dealer. He sells tombstones. You can see the tombstones here, over here. And uh, so he's, he's there with his business and his wife is out here at the house and the, you know, the, everybody's posed here for this. Uh, the stereo view that was taken in 1875. This is in Vermont someplace, but you can, I was able to read the sign over the, the store and it's George M. Farrington, dealer in marble. Uh, students, here's a one room schoolhouse and, and students about 1880, nice stone schoolhouse. And the kids must be uh, uh, recess time, they're out playing. Looks like they're playing Ringer on the Rosie here. But again, just wonderful documentation of 19th century life. And uh, again, when you're, when you're looking at these through the stereoscope, it puts you right into the picture. Bands and parades. Uh, you know, these were very popular in the 19th century. You have to remember there was no television. Entertainment was live. People would turn out to see the band, every, every community had a local band. So here's a band marching here. And, and this is sort of difficult to see, but this is a band, they're on a bandwagon. 
So they're being pulled around playing music. And cornet bands were really popular every place in the 19th century. The circus, the circus would come to town. This is a circus parade. See the elephants? This is Barnum Circus in Washington. And uh, you probably hear my phone ringing. <laughs> It'll stop. <laughs> Uh, and then this is in Washington, D.C., and here's a circus parade in Washington, about 1880. You see the elephants. The elephants were a big part of these circus parades. So, and... Uh, So this is another popular thing was were residences. People like to have their homes photographed in stereo. So this is an advertisement on the back of a card. And it, and it said, uh, published by B.C. Uh, Kennes, Castleton, Vermont. Stereoscopic views made of residences at $3 per dozen. So you could hire a stereographer to come and take a picture of your house. And of course, you and your family would stand out in front of it. And uh, like, like this view here. And here's some more uh, views of people's houses with the family standing out in front. I think these are great. I love these kind of views. People were proud of their of their houses, and it gives you an idea of as to what things were like. Dirt roads, which really got muddy in the in the in the spring. Uh, people didn't mow their lawns the way we do today. Tall grass here, uh, and they didn't have screens. When they opened their windows, the bugs would come in. <laughs> Uh, I also had the did the back of one of these cards so you can see sometimes the photographer uh, would put on the back of his card um, the, the the titles of the views that he would have for sale and the view that uh, you were looking at would be underlined so but it, would, it gives you an idea of some of the the things that uh, they uh, they photographed okay so. That gives you an idea as what were popular views for people to see. And of course, there were many other categories as well, but these were some of the most popular. Now, by the 1890s, the stereoscope was used for education purposes as well. So people like Underwood and Underwood published a series of things uh, for like Sunday school or for use in the school. So this is a Sunday school lessons, 1912. And basically what they are, are their, their views of uh, the Holy Land that people could look and they're all numbered. And this is a box that, that holds them. You can see where it comes apart here. And, uh, and also travel, there were uh, travel cards too. So you could go to different foreign countries. You could buy a set of views from uh, different countries. And, uh, and visit them through the stereoscope. Uh, they were used in the classroom as well to learn about places, uh, perhaps different countries like India or, or China to see what things were like. And so each of the students had a stereoscope. Today, they have laptop computers. Back in 1900, they had stereoscopes and uh, they could see what the, the rest of the world was like. Well, there was also things that uh, uh, would supplement your stereo cards, holders. So here you can see this tin type of this, this lady in the 1870s. And as a photography prop, she has a stereo card holder here on the table next to her. And here's what it looked like. So they had these elaborately carved stereo card holders that you could, you know, you'd have your table in the parlor, you'd have your stereoscope and you'd put your different views uh, into the uh, into the card holders. And they came in many different formats. This is an elaborate one. You can see it. And then it has like this, this roll top cover that comes over the top to protect it. And then it go, rolls down under it. Uh, so that dates to about 1880. Uh, here's a whole variety of, uh, of 
carved stereo card holders from the 1870s, uh, different formats. And uh, a lot of people don't know what these are, so I can pick these up at antique shops for next to nothing. But they supplement the, the stereo views. So uh, later 20th century stereo viewing. So the stereoscope remained popular up until about 1930. They started losing, people started losing interest in it because of technology, because the radio came in, we had mo motion pictures. Uh, so the stereoscope became passe. But in the 1930s, other forms developed, like this was a true view film strip viewer about 1935. And this was developed in the 1930s. Uh, and it made use of film to create three dimensional images. So it was like a roll of film and you'd thread it through here and the images would be paired. And then of course there was the Viewmaster, which was introduced in 1939. And I think a lot of us are familiar with this. I remember I had a Viewmaster and a whole set of reels uh, to go in it. Um, they, they're on a circular disc and the images are paired opposite each other. So then you can uh, look at the views in 3D. And then, uh, Stere amateur stereo photography became popular in the 1950s. And so people were taking stereo views. This is a Kodak stereo camera, uh, about 1955. I've actually taken stereo views with this camera, but now you can't, people don't develop film anymore. It's all uh, digital. Uh, here, so you take your pictures with that camera. This is what the slides look like when they're developed. Okay, and then so this is a viewer for it. You put this in the little viewer here and then you can look at it in 3D. And this is a little case for your slides. The slides will go in these drawers and then the viewer fits right in this slot here and the door closes and you have this little case for your viewer and your slides. About 1955. And of course, the interest in stereo views continues today. There's the National Stereoscopic Association. Uh, and they publish a, a monthly magazine, which has a lot of historical stuff in it, but it also has modern stuff in it because people continue to take stereo views today and there's a whole club of people. And of course, 1950s when people were taking stereo views was really interested in stereo views. Remember, some of you may remember the stereo, uh, the 3D movies like The House of Wax, um, and, and there was 3D comic books, I remember as a kid, and you had the, uh, the, the gl glasses that you looked at when you looked at the 3D comics. So 1950s was, was a popular time. But then uh, today there's a group of people who still pursue 3D photography. So it still, still goes on. And now if you get to the library, here's the, uh, the exhibit. We have an exhibit of some of this material and you can actually see it for real, uh, all the way from the Holmes Bates viewer uh, down to the, the view master. And here's the true, the uh, camera that I showed you in the slide, some of the stereo view holders, etc. So I hope you can get to the library. I think this exhibit will be there until the end of December. So that's all I have for you. And uh, hopefully you enjoyed it and uh, be happy to answer any questions if there are any questions. Thank you, John. Um, I'm glad you mentioned the display at the end. I meant to mention it at the beginning and I neglected to do so. So please do come to the library and take a look at the display. Uh, just be sure to have your face covering, of course, when you come in. Um, I don't see any questions right now. I'll give people just a moment in case anything occurs to them. This is being recorded. So if you know somebody who you think would be interested and didn't get to join us today, you can just direct them to the library's YouTube channel which you can access from the bottom of the library's main web page. It'll take a couple of days to get up there, but it'll be up there relatively soon and you can share it with those you think might be interested or watch it again yourself. Um, I don't see any questions. So if nobody- okay. has... well, th well, thank you very much. Thank you for joining us today. If something occurs to you later, you can feel free to email me and I'll send it on to John and we'll answer it whenever, whenever it occurs to you, so. Thank you, John, and thank you everyone for joining us.